Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is the 11th lecture in the history series, When Did Postmodernism Begin? I'm going to talk first about a couple of literary definitions of postmodernism because postmodernism wasn't theorized first in the visual arts. It was theorized by people in literature and philosophy, and then those ideas were imported into visual arts. And then a little bit about um, some uh, disagreements about the relation between postmodernism and modernism. Because some of the earliest uh, and most influential theorists of postmodernism felt that postmodernism was a really important break with modernism, but others felt that it was really just um, a late kind of modernism or a version of modernism uh, that was um, somehow not as good as the original, a debased version. And so that kind of, um, that kind of question um, that kind of question has never been resolved, but the theorizing of postmodernism has always contained this doubt about the status of postmodernism. That's what the second topic is. And then I'm going to end with some start dates for postmodernism, dates that it's been proposed to have started at. So first of all, literary definitions. One of the earliest is by a critic named Charles Altieri. He's a literary scholar, literary, literary critic. Um, and he wrote an essay in 1972 or three, uh, arguing that what he called symbolist poetry, which to him meant uh, poetry in which uh, images point to something beyond themselves. They have a, a deeper significance and they act as symbols. That's this symbolist kind of poetry was now finished. And in its place, uh, there was emerging a poetry that was about itself and its pure presence, in which images didn't point to anything beyond themselves, but the poem was about itself. And these two ideas about how an artwork can be about itself and not about anything else, and also that an artwork can be um, of interest for its pure presence, the poem on the page, the poem in the mind, and so on, uh, both of those ideas fit perfectly art of the 60s and 70s, especially minimalism. But Altieri wasn't thinking about that, wasn't writing about that, and these, these early essays um, didn't have immediate influence on visual art. Um, but in, in the next several years, there were a lot of uh, crossovers. There's an Egyptian-born scholar, Ihab Hassan, who wrote a number of essays in the 1980s comparing modern and postmodern characteristics and defining postmodernism, and he liked lists. Um, in fact, if you go to his Wikipedia page, you'll find somebody's collected a whole bunch of these, uh, of these tables that he did, and I have just a couple of them here. So, for example, Hassan thought that modern art was about form and postmodern art was about anti-form. He thought that modern art was about distance and postmodern art was about participation, meaning um, political engagement. That modern art is about hierarchies and postmodern art is about anarchy. And you can see the rest of these. So over on the right, um, a couple of the leading ideas. Hassan felt that uh, in postmodern art, there was this tendency to avoid clear form, that you wouldn't you know, make a figure or an idea uh, clearly, but you would somehow obscure it or erase it. Um, you would avoid unity and synthesis and harmony in favor of what he called anti-form. He also felt that postmodern artists were suspicious about ideas of creativity and creation. These are ideas that are still really common in the art world, and there's an awful lot of talk in studios about creation and creativity. But to Hassan, these were modernist ideas, and um, postmodern artists, uh, he said, were more interested in deconstructing ideas, especially ideas of the, creati the creative genius and so on. Um, and the last one is maybe the most important one. Um, Hassan uh, thought that postmodern artists are uh, we're in the process of rejecting uh, power centers, origins, like in Origins of Art and important influences uh, of important artists and central master narratives and so on, roots, and as in roots of culture and, or roots of different uh, media, in favor of multi-directional rhizomes. So rhizomes are these really thin hair-like um, threads that come out of roots, out of the sides of roots and they grow sometimes in a kind of fungal looking, looking fuzz. Um, and this, I, this idea uh, that, that um, there is no central power structure anymore, but that um, 
that uh, influences and concepts and um, and directions of motion go in all go in all ways. That idea um, uh, and the word rhizomes comes from the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze that we'll be looking at later. Um, but what it basically means here is that, uh, according to Hassan, the, that there is no center. There's no guiding idea um, in postmodernism, uh, and there's no and there's no magnetic center to the culture in terms of an artist or a concept, uh, but things run in all different directions. There's also this interesting difference between um, the visual arts and some other arts when it comes to naming who the principal modern and postmodern artists were. If you look outside the visual arts, you find there's a lot of disagreement about who were the most important modern and postmodern artists. Um, and I put a couple of these in table in this table. Some of these are actually um, paradoxical, as in paradoxical history. They actually, re re they actually uh, reverse chronology. So in the third row, Robert Lowell is an American poet from the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and Gertrude Stein is the expat American poet from the first half of the 20th century. And yet she's been called postmodern and he's been called modern even though she was working before him. Um, and that ha that's happened a couple different times. And some of these also contradict each other. So it has been claimed, for example, in the, in the field of music that Pierre Boulez in the second row from the bottom, who's a composer conductor, that he's one of the most important modernist composers and he was followed by postmodern composers. But it's also been claimed that he's a postmodern composer and he was preceded by modern composers. So this kind of disagreement doesn't happen very much in visual art with one important exception and that is Duchamp because it's been said of Duchamp that he was postmodern way back in 1913, which made him a postmodernist before modernism had hardly even gotten started. I can't explain these, uh, the fact that these theories are so widely divergent for, from each other, but it is sometimes interesting to think about the fact that in the visual arts, our chronologies that we tend to accept about modern and postmodern um, are very different from what they are in other arts. And there's often very little conversation um, between different media, between different arts. Okay, second topic is this one about how postmodernism might or might not be different from modernism. And here I have uh, maybe five or six slides with one philosopher, one writer on each slide, just to give uh, the shortest possible indication of uh, some of their positions. But most of these um, here and on the next couple slides, they're all uh, well known and they, you might very well get assigned them in other classes. Um, so I just put them in here in case you might wanna follow up on any of their ideas. So this first one is Frederick Jameson, who wrote a influential book called Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism in 1991. Um, and he argued that postmodern culture has simplified the past, i.e. modernism. It's simplified modernism into pastiches. So that we're actually just playing out flattened versions or parodies um, of what was real and living in modernism. Also that we've become presentist, uh, a term that came up in lecture four. Uh, that is to say that uh, in, this, in the postmodern condition, we don't uh, feel that we need history, that went uh, deep or shallow, but we live in the present. Um, and he most famously makes the uh, argument that postmodernism is really only a staging of late capitalism, by which he means it doesn't have the intellectual freedom that we often like to imagine that we have, but that actually our supposedly free thought rehearses capitalist values. So all of that is a very strong critique of postmodernism, but it also ends up implying that postmodernism is in fact very different from modernism. Another theorist of postmodernism is Jean-Francois Lyotard, who's gonna come up in the next lecture. And he's often credited for introducing the word postmodernism into cultural debate. Um, although if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, the word postmodernism was in use way back in the teens. Um, so I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, uh, the book is widely read. His books are widely read. So in Leotard's view, postmodern truth is no longer a series of narratives. Narratives uh, would be in our case, things like stories as in the conventional story of art from prehistory to the present. 
master narratives, uh, narratives and uh, that are widely believed in culture and and prevent a, and 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 um, constitute a kind of a bedrock for a cultural understanding. So Leotard says we no longer have these narratives; we don't believe in them anymore. But instead, what we have is uh, fragments. Uh, of different ideas and languages that float around like clouds, that's his term for it, and they're only bound temporarily by performance of new codes, meaning different ways of talking, different discourses and so on, and also by our hope uh, that we might achieve something sublime, and that's a concept um, that I get to in, uh, in lecture eight in the concept series, in case you want to go look up the sublime. But with Leotard, uh, what matters most is that we have in postmodernism um, a condition in which um, truth is no longer bound together in cause and effect chains, in stable stories and narratives, uh, but it exists um, in pieces. Uh, so we live in a world of uh, fragments, fragments of, of knowledge, fragments of understanding. Other philosophers and critics um, have developed views in which uh, postmodernism is not a significantly new period. Um, and one of those is Matei Kalinescu, um, the Romanian literary theorist. He wrote a book on modernism and he somewhat reluctantly added a last chapter on postmodernism. Um, and in that he argues that postmodernism fell into a kind of parody or repetition of modernism, a kind of an echo of modernism. For him, the more important category is more important than postmodern versus modern. Uh, the more important um, concepts are kitsch and decadence. Um, and he sees those as signs of decline uh, that includes what, what uh, is generally called postmodernism. Uh, in this interest on kitsch and decadence, he follows the 19th century philosopher Nietzsche, um, who was the first to explore these concepts, um, kitsch and decadence, and to think of them as signs that a, a culture was in decline. Uh, that caption has nothing to do with his lecture. I was just uh, surprised to find a picture of him from his own diary. That's him second from left. And on the back, he had written in Romanian, who will die first? Uh, another person who has um, described postmodernism as a kind of pale echo of modernism is the uh, English art historian T.J. Clark, Tim Clark. So for him, we're still very much in thrall of problems that modernism set itself. The principal questions of culture, how art responds to the world, what happens with politics in art. He says, we, um, we still are trying to work our way through them, but we're now largely incapable of it because we have um, maybe not so much completely forgotten them as abandoned them. We certainly have uh, misunderstood them repeatedly and egregiously to the point where we don't stand much chance of solving the problems that modernism posed. Quote, modernism wished to understand and put under real pressure the deep structure of belief of its own historical moment. But most beliefs disintegrated, most beliefs disintegrated, but postmodernism doesn't know how to look to see what its beliefs might be. And that's, um, that's not just Tim Clark's charge. A number of people have said that postmodernism actually doesn't understand what it might believe or what beliefs are or what it would mean to hold a belief. And that's one of the things that prevents it from being a continued engagement with the period before. This is the last of the theorists I want to mention in this section, Jürgen Habermas, who's also widely assigned in mostly in, in classes and uh, in liberal arts. Um, and he's also criticized postmodernism uh, for a number of reasons. I just put two of them down here. Uh, one of them is that the theorists of postmodernism have stances and not stands. And that's very true because uh, in the last number of decades, the word stance has become much more common um, in writing on culture. Uh, you don't take a stand anymore, but you have a stance. In other words, you're avoiding questions of commitment um, and you're hypothesizing uh, positions that you may or may not actually uh, believe in. And then also, um, uh, postmodern uh, theorists um, are guided still by judgments, but they don't reveal them. Uh, and there's a connection there to the question of how art criticism has become neutral, uh, which I um, discussed a bit in the first history lecture. Um, so judgments are still around, but it's not uh, a thing uh, anymore um, to reveal them or discuss them directly. And so from Habermas's perspective, uh, 
postmodernism is a kind of evasive elaboration of modernism, not actually a new departure. So there are some, those are some of the um, guiding texts and people on this ongoing kind of question about the relation between modernism and postmodernism. It's not the kind of question you can ever resolve um, and because it leads uh, from narrow, quite nar narrow problems having to do with individual artists, it leads out into these really big uh, cultural and philosophic questions. Okay, so I want to finish by giving some start dates that have been posed for postmodernism. First of all, uh, it has often been said that the border between modern art and postmodern art is more or less in the 60s. Um, and I think that there are um, many, critic, many critics and art historians would say that there's a general consensus on that. A good test of whether or not uh, your teacher believes something like this um, is um, not just how often they talk about the 60s, but also how often they look back farther in history to explain things that happened in the 60s. And this is something you can listen for in your art history classes. How often is it necessary or how often does your teacher explain things that happened in the 60s by reference to things that happened in the past? Usually the earliest references to previous art will be somewhere around 1900. Sometimes people will talk about um, earlier 19th century art, but usually not so much things before that. Um, that's, one of the, that's one of the signs, um, uh, but of course the principal one is a focus on actual events of the 60s. Um, and that's uh, the implication, of course, is that that's when, the, that's when the new cultural moment defined itself. So that's what needs to be, um, that's what needs to be looked at most closely. Art critics have also weighed in on this question. Dave Hickey is an American critic. He's, he's known for writing in the uh, style that's, that's a kind of a wild, um, as he says, wild west mixture of periods and styles of writing. Um, and he has put the beginning of postmodernism in 1962 very exactly. Um, he dates the beginning of postmodernism to a specific symposium at the Museum of Modern Art, and this is the press release for that, um, for that exact symposium. It lists some of the people that were there, and I've underlined Leo Steinberg there because Leo Steinberg's another person um, who's, who uh, said when he thought that postmodernism began. Um, he also introduced the word postmodern into art historical writing. That was before Leotard. Um, and he associated the movement with pop art and specifically with Rauschenberg's collages. So that's more or less putting uh, the beginning of postmodernism in the same year, 1962. Um, Rauschenberg's collages for Steinberg are postmodern in a very particular way because they have no unified viewpoint, because every time you paste a photograph into a collage, you're adding a, a, a scene taken from a different perspective, a different distance, a different orientation, and so on. And also, according to Steinberg, these Rauschenberg collages are postmodern because um, they were made uh, flat on a table or the floor uh, instead of tilted up uh, on, a, on an easel or hung on the wall um, uh, of a studio like conventional um, paintings used to be. And both of those for Steinberg are uh, very important changes because they go against um, the idea of the picture as a window into the world that was in use since the Italian Renaissance. Another person who has an idea about when postmodernism started is the philosopher Arthur Danto. Um, and he dates it to the first exhibition of Warhol's Brillo Boxes, 1964. Uh, and that's partly because the Brillo Boxes are deliberately unoriginal, but also, so Danto says, it's because uh, from that moment of that exhibition, artists no longer need to think about modern art history because they can use any style and any period of war art that they want. I'm going to say more about this in the next lecture. So by way of conclusion, depending on which one of these you choose, you have very different ways of thinking about postmodernism. Um, these, these theories can't all be uh, sort of generally right because they're actually, some of them strongly contradict each other. So another way to pose this problem is to ask whether postmodernism even is or was a period at all. And that's the subject of the next lecture.